All right, so humor me for just a second. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine the situation. You and me are in an airplane. We're 10,000 feet off the ground, and I've given you the assignment to jump out of that airplane and come safely to the ground. And my question to you is, how are you going to do it? Are you going to jump out of the airplane and start flapping your arms? <laughs> this is going to be a humorous one. This is nothing to intimidate anybody. You're going to start flapping your arms, hoping to the Lord that you can displace enough air to where you come safely to the ground? Are you going to jump out and hope a huge albatross grabs you and you know carries you safely to the ground? Probably not going to happen. I know. These are the things that go through my head. <clears throat> or... What's the option that we would most likely choose? Parachute. Now, that's not my answer. My answer is I'm never getting in the airplane to jump out of it. But anyway. So here's the thing. I, keep your eyes shut. Those of you who have, have them open, I can see you. <laughs> but there's two parachutes on this plane. Two parachutes, and you get to choose which one you want to strap on and jump out with. One is actually not packed yet. You have to pack it yourself. I'm no help. I'm just a pastor. I'm not a skydiver. I'm not a paratrooper. I'm not a parachute expert. But the other is, in fact, uh, prepared by an expert. It is, in fact, this person who invented parachutes and knows exactly how to make the perfect parachute that will open every time and even in itself is self-guiding you all the way down, allowing you to just relax and trust the parachute maker, you know where I'm going with this, to get you to the ground safely. Now, which parachute are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the one that you, a novice, knowing nothing other than you really want to live, are you going to trust that parachute that you're going to pack yourself, or are you going to pick Jesus' parachute? The answer should be obvious, should it not? You can open your eyes. Could you picture it in your mind? I mean, it, even as I'm saying, I'm not picturing this. We've got a parachute we use with the kids. It's probably not even big enough for what is a, a real size parachute. But I can't imagine, I wouldn't even know where to start on how to pack that in there. What I'm getting at here is we as humans tend to approach life as I'm going to do it my own way. When people out on the streets are asked the question, why should God let you into heaven? They've got their own answer. If they're not a believer in Christ, they've got their own answer, do they not? Well, I hope that's, that when that time comes that my, my good has outweighed my bad. I hope that my good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds, and hopefully, there's no certainty, <laughs> but hopefully I would think that God would think I've not been that bad of a person. Any of you ever watch Ray Comfort's uh, videos online? Live, I think it's Living Water. He's an evangelist. He's from Australia. And he drills these people with this question, why should God let you into heaven? It's, it's remarkable to hear the responses. But most of us, as we go through life, especially as we are sinners, especially as we, father, we, we go after our mother and father Adam in a, turning a, away from uh, what God says is the way, we choose our own way. We want to stuff our own parachute, and we want to jump out into life in our own parachute. In the end of chapter 9, we're in Hebrews 9 tonight, starting in verse 16, if you want to turn over there. And leading into chapter 10, the author is taking the Hebrew believers on their final look at doctrinally why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. These believers had been raised in the Jewish tradition in keeping the law and sacrifices. They had transitioned over to believing in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they've been struggling with drifting back to their old ways because of persecution. And now the author is wrapping up his argument on why doctrinally they should hold fast to Jesus alone and not drift back. So far in the book of Hebrews, we've been... Uh, on a journey with the author in these struggling Hebrews, <clears throat> discovering why and how Jesus is better. Jesus is better because he's God's son. 
He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He is our great high priest, establishing a new and better covenant in his blood by offering his own life as a perfect sacrifice. All this has been covered already, and we're going to wrap up a few details here tonight. But why is it that we too struggle in this ourselves sometimes? What I'm talking about is why do we struggle with drifting back to some of our old ways? I don't think that it's any mystery that in the last two years we've been tested. No? Has your faith been tested? How many of you had your patience tested? Okay. What happens when we face trials is we naturally are going to turn to what we have known the longest and depended on the most. Some of us, that's our faith. Some of us, it's our own understanding. Some of us, it, some people in this world turn to alcohol. Some turn to drugs. Some couldn't stand the pressure and they took their own life. I mean, suicide was skyrocketed in the last two years. So there's all kinds of ways that people deal with struggles. Here in Hebrews, they are taking freedom and faith in Jesus Christ and they're saying, I don't know if I want that anymore because life's too hard. I want to pick up this bag and this parachute and start packing my own parachute. And that's where we find the Hebrews tonight. Struggling to turn back to their own ways, turn, back to, turn their back on Jesus and go to what is safe and comfortable. They're considering reverting back to depending on good works to do what they could, what they could do to deal with their sin problem. They're being tempted to flap their own arms and stuff their own parachute. I want to start in verse 15, actually. We're mainly going to cover 16 through, but 15 is the start, uh, uh, kind of where we ended last week. So let's start there. It says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. I, I highlighted a death that redeems. Because that's different than the death of the animals, the countless animals that had to be sacrificed and the blood spilled through all of the sacrifices for all those years. In verse 16 it says, For where a will is involved, in that word will, we're talking about a will and testament. Like a, a death, you know, like you, somebody dies, they've got a will prepared. But that will, we're going to see, it, it doesn't really take effect unless the person that the will is about dies. So let's keep reading. For there is a will involved, the death of one who has made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. I want to stop there for just a second because this addresses an idea that came onto the scene at some point. There's this idea that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. You ever heard this? Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just fainted. <laughs> so he didn't really die. The covenant, the transaction that is happening between Jesus' death and what happened in heaven is a will and testament. The only way that you and I have salvation through Jesus Christ is if he died, if his blood was shed, if he rose again. It says, Therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So one of the main differences between what happened in the tabernacle and happened with all of these sacrifices, when you compare that to what actually happened with Jesus Christ and his death, is everything that happened in the tabernacle was a copy. We're going to read about that here in just a second. But it's a copy. And, and those sacrifices didn't do away with sin forever. They covered it. And this is another one of those 
stupid ideas that popped in my head today, but track with me if you can for a second. Anybody ever play whack-a-mole? The, the mole pops up, you whack it, and it goes down, and another one pops up. In my mind, sacrifices were almost like whack-a-mole because they just keep popping up. I may give a sacrifice for this one, but another sin pops up over here, and I eventually got to give another sacrifice for that one. Whack it down. Jesus comes on the scene with the biggest paddle you've ever seen and obliterates it. There's no more moles. They're not popping up. They're not like the gophers out in the yard that we trip on their holes. They don't keep popping up. They're gone. I don't believe there's going to be any gophers in heaven. I, don't, I can't find that in Scripture anywhere. <clears throat> but the sacrifices in the temple were a covering for sin, for purifying the flesh. Jesus' sacrifice was forgiveness. Forgiveness is a whole different deal. Forgiveness is being pardoned from the penalty of your sin. Forgiveness is freedom, is to give deliverance. Sin is gone. We're going to see at the, at the end of our passage we're going to cover tonight what God actually does with our sin. That's why it's so important for the author to remind these believers that what Jesus did on the cross didn't just cover our sins, it redeems, forgives, and gives freedom from our sins that otherwise would have condemned us for eternity. So what is being addressed here are the final details of why Jesus' sacrifice had to happen in order, in order for us to be received, to receive forgiveness. Death has to have happened since day one uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, their first sins cost animals' lives. It says that the animals, that God covered them with animal skins. And I don't think the animals just donated their hide. Y'all can laugh at that if you want to. <laughs> they had to be killed. Their blood had to be shed because two people believed a liar rather than the truth. Let's keep reading. Thus it is necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, talking about the sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You see, you wouldn't handle a copy with the original. You wouldn't handle something that could be dealt with in a lesser way with something that would handle it supreme. And it's not even the right place to do it. Because look what it says here. For Christ has entered into, not into holy places made with human hands, or made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Whew. Sorry, but I'm not sorry. Because if that doesn't move you, your wood's wet. You've got the God of the universe sending his son down to this earth. He dies on a cross and takes his sacrifice to heaven. Goes before the Father and says, I've done it. I've paid the price. It's done. He's gone there on your behalf. And he's gone there on my behalf so that our sin will be dealt with once and for all. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. Remember, this is an author talking to, I keep saying author because we don't know exactly who wrote it, but this is an author writing a letter to people who are familiar with, in fact, the, the sacrifice and all that were still going on when this letter was written, and he's comparing what Jesus did going once into this and comparing that to the, the other priest, he says, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters holy places every year with blood not of his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once for all. Not going in and killing an animal, sprinkling its blood, and coming back again because we're just covering it. Jesus, his sacrifice didn't cover it. It obliterated it. 
It was put away. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins for many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus entered heaven to appear before God, the great high priest, entered not a copy but the real thing, entered the presence of God the Father with a perfect sacrifice, his life given, his blood shed, in order to intercede for us in a way that the law never made possible. This will that is spoken of is a covenant. That's another word for will, and, and I've already gone through that. There is a, a legal, contractual agreement that took place with Jesus in heaven. And he went before God the Father to atone for our sin. Two things are described here in verse 28, though. It says, first, a man is appointed to die and once and then come to judgment. That's what you and I are going to go through. We know biblically there are some exceptions to that. Enoch and Elijah and uh, <laughs> Lazarus. Um, Lazarus died again, by the way, just so you know. So, but that's our process. We are destined to live once and die once. Reincarnation, not a real thing. Okay? But what is Jesus' role? He came again to appear, once to take care of sin, and the second time he's coming to save us. You say, well, I'm already saved. It's not completed yet. Okay? There is coming a day when he will complete it. And what did it say he's coming, who he's coming for? Those who are eagerly waiting for him. A statement like this where he says, I'm coming again, but not to deal with sin. I'm going to deal with sinners. And it's going to be determined by the decision that you make in this life, whether you're going to place your faith in me and follow me, or whether you're going to reject me. A statement like this either is going to fill you with elation, just the thought of one day Jesus returning and us being in his presence. Do you feel joy or do you feel anxiety? I can't wait. Especially the, the longer we live and the grayer our hair gets, amen? We, we just look forward to seeing Jesus again. When I was young, I was like, I just want to kill a big buck. Let's go. I just want to get married. I just want to see Jesus. If that thought of his returning to deal with sinners brings anxiety to you, I want to caution you. You could be in one of two camps. Either you don't know Jesus at all, or you have salvation through him, but you don't understand what it's all about. He has given us everything we need to know in his word to have joy and peace and salvation through him. His return should make us anxious, eager, waiting for him. A day that goes by that he doesn't return, we, we might should be a little disappointed. But if you're the other person that says, I've got anxiety because I don't know where I stand. Guess what? Your heart's still beating. And there's still time and there's still hope. The question is, are we eagerly waiting for him? What is our heart attitude? Think about that. Let's go on to chapter 10. We're going to cover this as fast as we can. <clears throat> chapter 10, verse 1 says, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never... Notice that phrase. Take the law, can never, and on down the line it says, make perfect those who draw near. So it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So you could be religious. You could, you could even convert to Judaism and go every year. I guess they don't have a temple now, do they? Sacrifices aren't happening. Hmm. wonder why that is. <laughs> We could be religious all we want. 
but it will not perfect even those most well-meaning, diligent, heartfelt, kind people if they are pursuing the wrong God and the wrong beliefs. It says otherwise in verse 2, it says otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered since worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? You remember early in, in chapter 9 it said that, that Jesus' blood dealt with the consciousness of the mind? But in these sacrifices, there are a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats. He's saying this on and on again because he's trying to drive it into their heads. Guys, forget the old ways. It's just a copy. I thought about this week, offering, having a kid come up and say, Hey, do you want $100? And pulling out Monopoly money. Monopoly money has got 100 on there. It, it looks kind of like a dollar hundred dollars right would you take it would it be of value to you if you're playing the game yeah it'd be a great value wouldn't buy you boardwalk or anything but if i had a would you would you want if i had a hundred dollar bill like united states currency and monopoly money which one are you going to want you're going to want the real thing But in these sacrifices, these are a reminder of the sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, and this is interesting because these next, uh, the rest of verse 5 and 6 and 7 are actually being quoted from the Septuagint of the Old Testament, Psalm 40. It's part of why I had asked Frank to read Psalm 40 tonight. He read up to these verses. The Septuagint reads just a hair different because that's the Greek New Testament. When Jesus was alive, that's the, New, or the Old Testament that they were using was the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. But this is what he sees. So he's probably reading from one of those scrolls. He says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. This is a messianic prophetic psalm. David's writing it, but he's talking about Jesus. But a body have you prepared for me. Now they're saying, Father, you set up this copy, but what your real plan was, the genuine, ultimate, perfect sacrifice, was to send your son Jesus to this earth, a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure do you think God took pleasure from bulls and goats having to be murdered so that they could have their sins covered for one more year? He didn't take it. It satisfies and keeps him from maybe taking them out. But it doesn't bring pleasure to him. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written for me in the scroll of the book. That will that is talked about there is not the other will. This is not a will and testament. This will is, I have come to do your pleasure. Whatever pleases you, God. Whatever you ask of me, God, I'm going to do. And, and David's writing this, of course, for himself, not even realizing at that time that he was writing it about what Jesus was going to come down and do to fulfill the will of the Father. And it was written down in all the prophecies. Verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desire nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first. And this is key. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. I came to complete it. I came to be the real sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. <clears throat> but when Christ offer, had offered for all time, I'm sorry, I skipped. In verse 10, and by that will, we have been sanctified. 
have been, past tense. This has already happened. He's talking to a group of believers. He's saying, you have been. If you're here today, you have been sanctified. You have been perfected in God's eyes. You are able to now exist in his presence. That's part of why the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Old Testament, you had to keep your distance from the mountain because otherwise you'd fall dead because you came too close to the presence of God. You have been sanctified, set apart for God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And he's going to go back to the priest again. And every priest stands daily, stands, remember that word, stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do? He sat down. One of the things that does not exist in the, in the Jewish temple, I find this kind of humorous, is a chair. <laughs> they had no time to rest. They were constantly taking sacrifices, taking the blood, filling the oil, filling the incense, bringing in the showbread, all of these things, all day long. They had people that that was their job 24-7. So every priest stands daily, but when Christ had offered that all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool of his feet. We know that sitting down means the work is done. It's finished. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Are you perfect sitting there today? It's not what he's talking about. There is a sanctification that happens at the time of salvation that is for eternity. And there is your life and my life as we walk day after day, submitting our lives to Christ and him changing us little by little to be more like him. Don't resist that. Don't try and walk your own road, doing it your own way. Some of us have had Jesus' parachute on our back and we're still flapping our our, our wings, our arms. Lean in to what Christ wants to do in your life and through you. How he wants to change you to be the person he wants you to be. So he can use you for his glory. Sounds bad. Use you. But that's what we were created for. His last few verses, he goes back to um, a passage from Jeremiah, I think it was 23, that he quoted in an earlier chapter. But he says, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. That last part of verse 17, I want us to key in on. Because this is what amazes me about our God. Has, has anybody ever wronged you? He stabbed you in the back, hurt you, betrayed you? Can you forget their sin? I mean, this I'm a, a finite, limited being right god is infinite he's capable of anything including remembering our sins no more he takes them away he puts them away if there's anything else in in this whole passage that should give us joy is that we're not going to have to sit there in god's presence with cowering with our heads hung thinking of all of the things that we ever did because he goes i don't remember them i died for them and I, I'm not going to remember him anymore. So you should live a life for me because I died for you, wiped away your sin, so you can walk a holy life set apart for me. Jesus paid it all. He's the only one who could pay the price. He fulfilled the contractual testament covenant, going before the Father in the perfect sacrifice once for all and set down because his work for our forgiveness was finished promise here 
is that he's coming back. He's coming back on an undetermined day to save those who are eagerly waiting his return. Waiting for that time, in verse 13, when his enemy should be made a footstool under his feet. This speaks to everyone who has ever existed coming under his power and authority, whether they like it or not. In Philippians 2, we get just a glimpse of this, and I'm going to end with Philippians 2. It says in verse 10, <clears throat> it says that, the, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you realize that? Did you, did you pick up on that? Every tongue. That means every tongue that believed in him and every tongue that rejected him. And they're all going to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because it's been revealed to them. Because they now see it, whether they followed him or not, whether they rejected him or not, they're all going to be forced to confess the truth. Not under torture, but they're going to, some of us going, Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's going to be others that are cowering and weeping. Jesus Christ is Lord, why did I miss this? Why did I reject it? Why did I make fun of it? Why did I decide to flap my own arms? So what do we do with this? I already talked about he's coming to save those that are eagerly waiting for him. In verse 12, it goes on to say, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my presence, this is Paul speaking, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. You and I don't need to flap our arms. We have a parachute. You ever notice the parachute? I've never parachuted, but I've watched videos on it. How many? I know I've got some paratroopers in here. Raise your hand if you've ever used a parachute to jump out of a... That's pretty cool. You, you've got guides, right, to steer you. What happens when you're going through life? You've got God's word and Jesus up there saving you, and you've got your cords to go, oh, I need to make an adjustment. He's there to steer you. His, he is at work in us both to will and work for his good pleasure. And this is these last three verses I want to end with. It says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. I don't like that verse. Did I just grumble about that verse? It is so easy to go through our Christian lives and just complain about everything. Man, the world. Man, our government. Trust me, there's stuff to complain about. I know. When you're walking through the, the store, do you want to make eye contact with somebody that's smiling or somebody that's frowning? I'd rather look at the person smiling myself. As we live out our lives, he's saying, don't grumble and dispute. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. It goes on to say other things because it's Paul and he's in prison. But read those last few words again. You who shine as lights in the world by doing what? By holding fast to the word of life. That's what we've been challenged to. If you're a believer, we are to go through this life full of the joy that God came to this earth to allow us to have because of what he did. He put us on this earth to be used to, for him to work in us, to will and work for his good pleasure. The question here is, are we allowing our questioning and grumbling and disputing about the world to turn us against the world that he's called us to reach? Or are we embracing it? Do we look on people that are lost 
and going to hell in judgment, or do we look on them with compassion? Joanne and I were just having this discussion the other night. To be able to look on somebody in every shape, form, and fashion, according to God's word, is doing vile things. I watched a video the other day. It's been about, it's been two or three weeks now. It's of a woman <clears throat> that's protesting the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And she's yelling through a microphone such vile things. I mean, describing what they do with the baby and celebrating. Do we look on that person and want to condemn them? Or do we let it break our heart that they don't know Jesus? I'm sorry, but there's only one answer for why somebody would feel that way about an unborn baby. And that's if they didn't know Jesus. Because if they knew the truth, they would be repenting. And they would come to Jesus. Guys, we have an opportunity in this life, and I'm, I'm, I think most of us have made this opportunity or taken advantage of this opportunity. But we've read tonight about the fact that Jesus is coming. And it's not an impending doom for those that believe. But it's an impending doom for those that don't. And I just want to give it, you know, you know where you stand with the Lord here tonight. I don't know your heart. You can tell me I believe in God. You can smile at me and have great conversations. But you know whether you belong to the Lord or not. And I just want to give you an opportunity tonight to get right with the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to pray for the rest of us. And I want to challenge you to seriously consider giving your life to the Lord. You will find no greater joy. You think, no, I want to flap my arms and stuff my own parachute. I have compassion on you. But I want to plead with you to don't wait. To give your life to the Lord here tonight. Let's pray.